There are all sorts of rules and regulations and policy changes that governments are instituting that are going to have an impact on our privacy, on our freedom and on the crypto space. And that's what we're going to be finding out about in this conversation. Take the first step towards online privacy. Get NordVPN. Got crypto? Got a hardware wallet to keep your crypto safe? Then you have to have one of these to keep your seed phrase safe. The Keystone tablet is fireproof, waterproof. You can use it to store 12 word, 18 word, 15 word, 24 word seed phrases. It comes with a full set of letters and everything you need to make sure that your seed phrase never gets destroyed or disappeared. Get one, get two, get three, have multiple copies. Use my affiliate link in the description below. Hi everybody, this is Crypto Rich, working with you to get rich with crypto, filling our pockets with crypto profits. I am joined by Skrilla from Secret Agents, which is one of the teams building on the Secret Network, and also Oliver, who is the founder of GovDAO.io, which is all about building better governance for Web3 applications, and they act as advisors to Secret Network. Now, before I introduce them, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter, CryptoRichYT, join my official Telegram announcements channel, and also if you're watching this on YouTube, come on, come on. Come on, come over to Odyssey, bit.ly slash crypto rich Odyssey, censor it resistant platform. And I post material there that YouTube wouldn't let me post on their channel. So you want to find out what that sort of stuff is, come over to Odyssey. All right. Hey, Oliver. Hey, Skrilla. Thank you so much for making yourself available. This is our second video because um, we recorded another one, which I posted a day or so ago, which is all about secret network. And this one is all about building better governance. Now, before I come to you, Oliver, Skrilla, do you want to just introduce yourself? Maybe then you can then introduce Oliver. Well, you're on mute, Skrilla. He's on mute. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Edit that bit out. Um, hello. Yes, it's good to be back on the show. Um, yeah, so um, so I have been part of a DAO that's been um, operating for um, about a year now. And uh, along the way, it's been quite uh, tough to uh, figure out how just to do governance properly um, when you've got a lot of people all over the world. Um, so I met Oliver um, pretty much around the same time that I was setting this this thing up, um, and he's been helping me along the way. Been a, been a great help and a, and a great friend along the way. Um, so yeah, Oliver, take it away. Tell us about Ubdal. Thanks, good and Crypto Rich, great to be back on the show. Thanks for having me again. Um, really looking forward to getting deep into the regulatory situation for blockchain and crypto because 2023 is really the year where a lot of projects who are building have to consider compliance. Um, and in relation to the, you know, their objectives, whether that be on secret network or other privacy chains, it's really, really important for, for everyone to really consider um, the regulatory circumstances that exist um, to date. Um, as Greta said, I'm the founder of Gov.dao. Uh, Gov.dao really um, was meant to be uh, a platform for building better governance. Uh, and it still remains the, the wider mission for Gov.dao to, to work towards that, that objective. Um, but we're, we're doing that in phases, essentially. And, and the first phase is by providing legal and regulatory advisory services and also blockchain development. So, for example, we're, we're building out DAO Tech at the moment, which goes to um, our objective to improve governance. We're also looking at how we can build compliant DEXs um, and, of course, all other legal and regulatory advisory services, um, advising various DAP, uh, DAPs, centralized projects um, on compliance with uh, laws that exist today. Very good. OK. And uh, you said supporting with regulatory compliance so what does that involve what sort of stuff do you do so for me it's there's a, a few prongs um to laws and regulations when it comes to blockchain and crypto um the first one is is uh, essentially what it means to issue a token so we're looking at securities laws and then on the second hand we're also looking at um anti-money laundering rules counter-terrorism financing rules and regulations and uh, this year and last year, we saw a lot of uh, jurisdictions who previously hadn't had a form of regulation introduce new digital asset laws, which would require projects who establish in their jurisdictions to essentially register as something called a virtual asset service provider, um, which comes with requirements to uh, do KYC, KYB on people using their decentralized applications or centralized applications. Right. OK, so now I can get it for a centralized application, like if there's an exchange or a company that, you know, a project that set itself up and registered as a company in a particular jurisdiction, and they've got employees, that they would need to go through all those formal processes. But how does it work for a decentralized? Yeah, project? this is the, the really interesting question, which we've been going deep on. And um, essentially, it comes down to uh, something called the Financial Act Action Task Force, who introduced uh, new updated re recommendations in October 2021 
which um, brought into scope uh, blockchain projects, whether they're centralized or decentralized, and essentially said that, um, of course, centralized projects have to be compliant, um, and then mentioned uh, what it means to be decentralized. And if you, and essentially it comes down to this, if you have sufficient control over an application protocol, et cetera, you are likely having to be registered as a virtual asset service provider. Um, and there are a few characteristics which kind of show that sufficient control, i.e. You, you totally own all of the IP, you're responsible for maintenance of, of the protocol, you're receiving rewards from that protocol. And you know, for example, if you're a DEX, you're taking fees from transactions that happen on that protocol. Um, and it's very, very, actually very difficult to be truly decentralized. I don't think, in my opinion, it's enough to simply have a smart contract, um, you know, providing all of the functions of the DEX. If there is a team who's behind the maintenance of it, they're getting rewards from from the activity on, on the application, that is enough to be sufficiently <laughs> sufficiently uh, centralized to, to have to potentially be regulated. And it is really difficult. And um, you know, it's one of the things that we'll be looking into further um, by trying to build um, an unregulated compliant DEX. Um, so looking at how we can actually put together something that wouldn't necessarily require uh, regulation in various jurisdictions, it's gonna be difficult. Wow. Okay. Because I'm thinking about the osmosis decks and also uh, secret network. So both have within the Cosmos ecosystem, both have uh, open source pro applications. There, there are teams of people working from them. I think with osmosis, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that you know they launched the to they launched the token, airdropped it. There's a community fund that I think they're in charge of. I think. They may be getting fees from the transactions on the DEX. I don't know. And there are named figures, public figures, behind the project. But then people can come along and tinker on the DEX and change it and fork it and set up something else. Security, Security is an issue. You know, if, you, if you're truly open source, you're at risk of, of being hacked and attacked, right? Um, so I think that that is difficult. If you were to open up development to all sorts of different third parties in the community, how do you actually control security to ensure that people and users who are using the platform have their funds secured, you know? Um, I mean, a good example perhaps would be, be Uniswap. Um, they did an airdrop of their token. Um, they, are, they have decentralized governance. Uh, their token is a governance token itself. Um, and interestingly enough, they don't take fees from uh, the Uniswap decks, um, as far as I know, in two days. Um, that being said, of course, they rewarded themselves uh, a ton of, of their own token and they have received external investment, which has continued on. But essentially, I mean, they're even actually a US entity, um, which is a software development uh, entity. And, and I think the way that they do it in Secure is that they will propose certain upgrades which then get voted on by, by the community, right? Um, I guess that's how they, they protect the security side of it. But, you know, in my mind, we do need that open source element. We do need, um, uh, you know, all sorts of different parties being rewarded for the efforts to to maintain the platform. Even some projects actually um, put the responsibility of marketing out to the community rather than it being an in-house thing, right? Um, it even comes down to who's who's paying for the hosting. That could be maybe a characteristic which shows sufficient control because if I'm paying for the hosting on AWS or whatever else, then that shows that I have control of that. I could take it down at any point, for example. Um, so it's interesting actually that you know, looking at different projects who, and, and actually we're working with a project called, called Hercules, which are now looking at how, um, various nodes can actually verify certain transactions and people who are hosting those nodes get rewarded for verifying those transactions in the you know, normal way that any protocol works, right? But specifically for a debt. And it's, and it's things like that, which we need to move towards to be able to, to say we are actually truly decentralized. Wow. Wow. That, I mean, I tell you what concerns me and what I don't want is KYC on DEXs. Mm -hmm. I don't want that, right? Because I don't want my information being collected and gathered and who knows what and captured by regulation or whatever but it sounds to me like that's going to be coming to to dexes even yes um I mean, and that that is very much the, the point right now is that um and, and why we're having this conversation about what is truly decentralized because if you have that sufficient control over dex you're going to have to register as a virtual asset service provider and you're going to have to comply with certain kyc requirements so you are going to have to collect user data now, that's why it was interesting um, in you know a previous chat the other day with, with Grita that they are now working on a system whereby you can still protect um, your wallet and your transaction history, but still um, enable the, the application to collect the necessary data it needs to be compliant with KYC. Um, but, you know, we are potentially looking at even worse circumstances with something that's due, well, it's due to come this year. I don't know if that will actually happen, but something called the uh, crypto asset reporting framework, um, which will essentially mean that uh, most 
uh, applications will have to report to the various tax authorities on their users' uh, holdings. And I think this will be difficult for DEXs, and I think it will even be difficult for, for centralized applications, because if you think about the amount of data that would need to be collected, or even the teams required to, to carry out that will be, you know, very, very difficult operationally. Yeah, which would, uh, which in a way will kill off innovation, because I know a lot of the projects that certainly I've interviewed, they're built on shoestring budgets. You know, they've bootstrapped themselves, and now they have to take this additional regulatory burden. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, um, you know, if you look at, for example, Tornado Cash, yeah. Uh, because that, that was obviously a huge story and, um, you know, it was taken down, um, sanctioned and, uh, you know, even even the, the founding developer, despite the fact that it had been trans- transferred over to uh, community management and governance, was still arrested, right? Um, mm. And that's the, like, the, the thing with these uh, AML laws and compliance is that if you do not comply um, and you don't take it seriously and you're not uh, taking necessary steps to KYC or end users, whether you're a DEX or a SEX, um, you are at risk of uh, falling foul of the regulations and potentially uh, attracting massive fines or even imprisonment. Um, so I think it's try. It's, I think for me, it's two things, right? You either accept the fact that you're centralized and that you want to be a true capitalist and profit from the applications you're running, and therefore you have to be compliant, or you start like Osmosis and other other people start thinking more about how can we be truly decentralized such that we can operate in this way, which means that um, you know. We, we we are fulfilling the the dream of of, of that freedom that crypto was, and blockchain was built for, right? Right, right. Okay. Now, just on the Thunderbird, um, is he still in prison? The developer of that, I forget his name. Uh, you know? I'm not sure actually. I'd have to check that. Right, right. Okay. And I understand what happened with Thunderbird is it got replicated, but as C because it's open source, it's CLI. It doesn't have the front end anymore. Mm. I don't know if it does now, but it didn't for a while. But yeah, there's been a couple, there's been a couple of attempts to to essentially like have a 2.0, um, but essentially it's going to face the fundamental problems. But but the issue there was really that it facilitated um, uh, money laundering, um, particularly from a, a North Korean um, organization, which I, I can't remember the exact number of volume that they put through Tornado Cash, but essentially that was what got it shut down and sanctioned. Um, you know, I, I do think there are good reasons um, to KYC because I think there are good reasons to protect against money laundering um, against you know organizations which do harm um, but it needs to be balanced right it needs to you know ensure privacy of those um, who are part there who have to KYC um, but also uh, with respect to achieving the goals of blockchain and crypto I think yeah 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 without killing innovation and killing business right. he was held for nine months without charge this guy developer so um so yeah he was released in april but he was he was held in prison for nine months after that that one got taken down and, and has he been charged for anything i don't think yeah i think he's it's i'm just reading through coin telegraph it says he's on a suspended sentence awaiting charges um he's back at home where he's got one of these ankle monitor things so he probably can't leave the house well, he was a developer. He probably lived in the basement anyway, so <laughs> didn't, didn't get enough sunshine. He's like, that's not a punishment. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, so w- now the, the other challenge that I'm sure you have is you've got European Union regulations, and then you've got British regulations, and then you've got US and Canadian and Australian and then Brazilian and Russian and Chinese. And how do you square that all? You know, it's funny, funny you bring this up, actually, because um, I was just on a call with a client um, who was getting licensed in the EU, um, actually going to, to Lithuania because MICA actually hasn't been um, been published yet and enforced. It's exp- it was meant to be in the, uh, you know this year, but it hasn't happened yet. But absolutely right. If you want to be truly compliant, you would technically have to be licensed in each of the jurisdictions in which you wish to provide your services. But obviously, that is crazy expensive, crazy time consuming, and you know, impossible for, for startups, small players, who, you know, there's huge barriers to entry, right? You know, you, only those who are like, you know, on the, on the Coinbase level could actually go ahead and, you know, when FTX, for example, I don't know if you ever saw their, uh, their legal entity structure, but they had an entity in, in most of these jurisdictions and were, had or were applying for various licenses to operate in, in those jurisdictions. But it's, it's, you know, only for those big players is that actually truly possible. And that's further further centralization and not good for the industry, in my opinion. But that just is the case. You know, if I want to provide my services in the European Union, I have to be licensed. If I want to be providing my services in the US, which is also impossible, by the way, I have to be licensed. And, and that's just how it is. Wow. 
Wow, 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 wow. And then that could get complicated, I think, with people using VPNs, because there are certain countries, I think Bangladesh is one of the countries where crypto is illegal. But with somebody in Bangladesh could use a VPN and then access a particular cryptocurrency project or application, then is that application liable? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question, um, because um, I have worked with exchanges before who have used the, you know, the geo blockers, um, to, to stop people from, who are prohibited from accessing their services. Um, but it's almost entirely poss- impossible to prevent people from using VPNs and people do it all the time. Um, but I just want to clarify something that, um, that I mentioned. Um, I mean, if we look again at Uniswap, one of my favorite examples, uh, for all intents and purposes, it kind of operates in the US, right? But because it's decentralized or decentralized enough, it's able to do so. Um, and I do think it's interesting that the SEC issued a Wells notice, I think over a year ago now, and I haven't really heard anything, or we haven't really heard anything further about their investigation into Uniswap, which makes me think that, you know, looking at how they operate and how they're modeled um, is useful for those seeking to, to launch DEXs um, in the future. Right. OK. Uh, now, I have this point of view of the SEC that they're um, legally sanctioned gangsters. I, I have this view about governments in general, right? <laughs> they're all, whether it's uh, Sunak and the British government or the European Union government, or the Russian government, or the American government. They're all gangsters, right, protecting their own turf. But the SEC, okay, we're going to issue some sort of notice against you for breaching some sort of regulation, but if you pay us off, we'll leave you alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, yeah their, their way of enforcement is by by litigation, by suing, suing the projects, right? Yep. Um, and then you know, later, if there's any criminal activity found, then, then the DOJ will take over from that. But um, yeah, I mean, that's that's how they do it. And that, that is one of the biggest complaints. But it's also interesting if you look at the recent actions against Coinbase and Binance, how they counter suit the SEC. And uh, that is very interesting. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, they tried they tried over and over again to actually, you know, visit the SEC and ask them what what they wanted them to do. And the SEC just didn't tell them and then, and then hit them with a uh, summons, didn't they? So exactly. you can't blame them. Exactly, because, you know, there are projects who want to be licensed. They want to go through the route, get properly licensed in order to be able to operate. But if you're unable to work with those who are regulating the industry to, to achieve that, then what can you actually do? It's it's killing that innovation. And you know, thankfully, we do have Coinbase who are powerful enough and, and, and uh, funded enough to to fight back this way. Yeah. And, I, 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 and Reggie Middleton fought back. But in the end, he had to pay it fine and then they let him go. It is a, it is a shakedown. Yeah. So, so Oliver, what sort of a gangster are you? Do you are you a gangster that fights off these these gangsters? What is it that you offer different projects? So, I, I'm fully on the side of, of innovation. Um, you know, one of the reasons why um, I invested in and, and operate Gov.DAO is to promote innovation and adoption of Web three. Right. So, um, whilst of course I, I am a lawyer and I respect all laws and regulations and and obviously advise compliance with those. I'm also looking at, you know, this aspect we talked about earlier of, you know, how can you be truly decentralized um, and operate in that way, which is what I truly believe in anyway, when it comes to, to blockchain and, and the ability and the technology that facilitates that. Um, you know, that's why I started uh, advising on DAOs and looking at that governance, because I truly believe that is how we can achieve um, the true philosophies of blockchain and, and financial freedom. Right. So then you can take. So if a project were to come to you, you could support them. And that this project says, look, we want to be truly, fully, completely decentralized. However, we are the people launching this. We're the one paying for the server hosting right now. What do we need to do? How do we need to structure ourselves? How do we need to operate so that it is truly decentralized? And and yeah. that's where you can advise them, right? And 100%. Yeah. So, you know, say uh, a decentralized exchange project comes to me, comes to gov.dao. Um, they're, they're seeking uh, information advice on how to be compliant, how they operate, how they can set up legally. Um, we have that knowledge uh, to advise them on, on how to do so. Um, and as I said, it's not super easy to be truly decentralized. And actually, it's often not the, um, the founder's intention, because, of course, um, a lot of people do want to profit from the, the great effort they're doing. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's just advising on trying to get that balance right and um, you know, ensuring that they're protected. But also, you know, um, the whole project or protocol is protected as well. OK. And I can, can you name any truly decentralized projects? I mean, apart from Bitcoin, of course. and and I think Doge as well. Doge is truly decentralized. This is a dog barking, barking around on the blockchain by itself. Well, well, actually, I mean, there's two different things here, right? We're looking at the the protocols and okay. the protocol tokens, um, and then we're looking at those uh, applications that are built on top of the protocol. 
right? And, and the laws and regulations differ slightly between between the two, right? So um, when it comes to, to protocols, um, decentralization, we're looking at models such as, you know, the, obviously the, the daddy model being Bitcoin and how that was launched and how um, you know, uh, mining uh, across all the different nodes around the world meant that it was decentralized enough that it wouldn't be classified as a security under under most jurisdictions. And as you know, it's classified as a commodity. Um, but then looking at how you know, central, central, basically the issue is that if you're a legal entity, a sole entity that's issuing a token, it's likely that that's going to be decentralized. But there are uh, great projects like, for example, Coinos. Coinos kind of tried to follow closely the, the philosophy of, of how uh, Bitcoin was launched. Um, but yeah, it could be careful. And then we look at the projects being built on them and, and the laws and regulations that apply to them in terms of how they can be decentralized. Okay. Okay. And can you? Are there any truly decentralized applications that come to mind? Yeah. Um, well, you know, maybe maybe Uniswap, but uh, that remains to be seen. Um, there is another project actually that I'm looking at called X7, um, and I'm happy to share the the white paper with, with you. But when I read that white paper, I you know, it, they, for me, they are trying to be truly decentralized. Um, they they are an international network of developers who join together in a DAO to to build this uh, build this project. Um, and I and I really do like their ideas and concepts. Um, for, for how they want to achieve uh, true decentralization. But um, it remains to be seen if they actually achieve that or not. Right. Okay. Okay. And then a um, couple of things come to mind there. What I think what this might drive is a greater degree of anonymity. You know, I'm thinking of, I don't know if you're familiar with Trade Ogre. Trade Ogre is a sex that deals primarily with privacy cryptos. And there's no information on who the team are or where they are or anything. Not not for someone like me who's got no coding experience that, you know, that could find out and stuff. Perhaps somebody could find out. But they're anonymous and it is a centralized exchange. And it deals with Monero and Pirate Chain and Dero and Wow Nero and a few others like that. So then they're not in any way public in you know the way that Coinbase is or Binance is. So I think there'll be a drive to that. And then also as a member of the Pirate Chain crew, and I know Pirate Chain is not a Web3 application, but they released the code, Proof of Work Coin. There's a team of volunteers that includes myself that run the project. We, I mean, we host a website, but the coin is out there being mined to, in mm -hmm. the same way that Bitcoin is out there being mined. Exactly, yeah. So, exactly. And, and for me, that's, that's you know, a decentralized model. Um, there is no one controlling entity. You have the the miners and the nodes who are mining, and uh, that is decentralized enough such that it wouldn't be subject to securities laws. Um, but you know, using Tornado Cash as another example, it doesn't matter how anonymous you are. Um, somehow, some way, if you're facilitating uh, money laundering, then yeah, someone's going to be looking into you, right? Okay, very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, all right, um, Oliver. Listen, thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to say or ask? Before we finish up um there's a whole bunch of things but uh you know i'd love to at some point talk about governance and politics with you uh because i know i know we can go deep on that so oh, we could go yeah, deep. Should... i'm yeah. holding back, <laughs> no, I'm <correct>. holding back. <laughs> well actually no no actually no, no let me stop let me stop no let's carry on because i have got a few other questions right so um a friend of mine was and this comes into the whole arena of privacy Generally, it may not be to do with uh, governance and stuff, but where things are going. So, for example, Crypto.com, they've changed their terms and conditions that if you're going to send, that they may at some point ask for the details for the KYC of the Kepler wallet that you're going to send your funds to. CRO or Atom or Osmo, if I purchase it, or if I'm going to send something to MetaMask, they want to know the KYC of the MetaMask. Then I had a friend of mine in the UK who wanted to sell some Bitcoin that he got in 2016 or 2017. And he was going through a British exchange and they said, OK, we want to know the provenance of this Bitcoin when you got it and the address that you got it from and the KYC for the for that address. Now, this was back in 2017. He didn't keep a log of it or anything like that. And he doesn't know who, where it was from, can't remember. And then what happened was they refused to do the transaction and they returned the Bitcoin to him, but not as Bitcoin. They returned the dollar amount of the Bitcoin. Okay. And and the value. So, for example, if it was, um, I don't know, one Bitcoin, I'm just making this up, and it was worth, at the time, $25,000, and the price dropped, they didn't return one Bitcoin to him. They returned $24,000. Bastards. That's, that's, 
that's rough. But um, but in general, what you were uh, first referring to there is something called the travel rule, um, which is a new part of uh, AML regulations, which essentially uh, requires um, service providers to um, collect the data of the sender and receiver um, for any transactions above one thousand dollars or more. Wow! 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 Okay, so keep it under a thousand. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. And then. Um... What was it then? What about the thing that's, I don't know if this would cover that they're bringing in in the UK and I think possibly in other areas as whatever, like they want backdoors in in encrypted projects. Would that apply to Web3 applications? They want to get rid of encryption or is it just for messaging apps? As far as I know, that's just for messaging apps at the moment, social media. Um, but there's no reason why that couldn't be um, wide ranging and broadly applied to to anything really, right? Um, and actually, that, that's very interesting that the European Parliament was talking about that. Uh, that's very thing. And um, so, yeah, they can do what they want at the end of the day in terms of these regulations and, and intrusions on privacy. Uh, I mean, yes, is it under under the um, objectives of trying to prevent uh, criminal activity? OK, but it still, ha in my opinion, always has to be balanced, um, you know, because you can't be screening everyone. Right. Um, you know, there needs to be a good reason for screening a particular person of interest, which, you know, that kind of already exists, right, in terms of, you know, having to have a court order. I mean, you know, maybe they're already doing it anyway. We don't know. Uh, we don't want this to be removed from YouTube. So uh, <laughs> let's not go too, too deep on that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it is. I suppose the way that I liken it, and this is to do with my own personal politics, which is that it's um, Stasi-like. It's bringing the practices of the Stasi onto the blockchain, that every single thing's got to be monitored and tracked and Big Brother's going to be keeping an eye on you, which I think is antithetical to creativity, to freedom and to the human spirit. I don't want to live in a Big Brother world. OK. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any, anything we haven't covered, Oliver, that you want to say? I think we're good for the moment. It's been, it's been. I always love like actually, you know, discussing um, what's happening in the blockchain world in terms of uh, laws and regulations. Um, it really is something that a lot of applications have to start looking at with a lot of urgency, uh, given given uh, the laws that already exist or or, or incoming. Um, so it's good to get the message out there. And gov.dao is here to to assist anybody who, who needs that advice moving forward. Great. Okay. Very good. Very good. Well, listen, thank you so much for taking the time. And Srila, thank you so much for introducing me to Oliver Smith. He is going to come back on my channel. I'm going to let him know in a few minutes about that when we finish recording. And for anybody who's watching, if you have any comments or questions about this, and even if it is just to give me a the ticker symbol as a comment, go on, go on, give me a ticker symbol, any ticker symbol you like for any, any of your favorite cryptos, um, please do so. And follow me on Odyssey. In between now, when I see you next, please keep filling your pockets with freedom and with privacy. This is Crypto Rich and Crypto Oliver and Crypto Skrilla signing out. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.